Our panel now is on cyber infrastructure. In March, Atlanta underwent one of the largest cyber attacks on a U.S. city ever. One-third of its software programs were thrown offline or partially disabled. 30% of those were considered mission critical, affecting core city services. The city attorney's office lost 71 out of 77 computers and a decade of legal documents, and the police lost all dash cam footage. This year, the city has requested $10 million in additional IT funding and recovery costs alone. So with this as a starting off point, we're going to be asking how does a city protect its cyber infrastructure against this in the future. And with us to discuss, we have Malik Ben Salem. She's Senior Research Principal for Cybersecurity R&D at Accenture. And Marcus Sachs, who is the CSO at Pattern Computer Inc. and was a plank holder who helped build the DHS cyber operation. So I have warned them. I've got a lightning round question from the red teaming side of the house. If you were an adversary, wanting to attack the United States, say perhaps the US made some move against you in the South China Sea. What city <laughs> would you strike and what would you attack? Uh, <laughs> that's a tough question. Um, so you wanna create the more damage, I guess, or disrupt things. So I would take I, a city I, I, I like want the White House to know I have power. <laughs> Uh, I would pick a city like Los Angeles because they have the largest airport, uh, you know, with the latest, with largest imports and uh, exports. Uh, but if we go back to the the, um, uh, the Atlanta example, you know, one reason why Atlanta was a target is because uh, they didn't have enough protections or their security posture was not that great. And I was checking the. Um, one of the rankings, city rankings, in terms of security posture, and um, what I found out, this was published by Dashlane, a company that uh, has a product for password vaults. I have them on mine. You have them on, okay. I have. Uh, one of the things they investigated is um, password strength in the top 20 most populous metropolitan areas in, in the US. And uh, so they estimated, they evaluated password strengths, strength um, passwords that are being reused, and they came up with this ranking amongst the population living in that area. And uh, in their ranking, Atlanta scored the worst. Wow. So if one, two, three, four, <laughs> ABC. Exactly. So if we're going to take that information and correlate it to the security posture, if there is any correlation, I don't know if there is any correlation, but you can argue that, okay, perhaps the people who are really cyber security aware working in the city would have, you know, improved the security posture of the city or the fact they're dealing with the city, they would have learned based on the security program. So that would have improved their awareness. So you may argue that there is probably some correlation between the two. So based on that ranking, you know, it's no surprise that Atlanta was attacked. So uh, the next one, the one before last in that ranking was Houston. So my answer would be Houston then. Got it, case. Houston. And would you go for the airport? Because they've got a pretty big airport uh, yeah, as well. Yes, that could be. Sure, yeah. okay. Um, all right, Marcus, put your, um, your evil villain hat on. Oh, well, since you picked Texas, I'll have to pick somebody else. But <laughs> the, um, the answer, though, if a, if a nation state wanted to do this, yeah. they're not going to just decide this afternoon, okay, mm -hmm. let's pick one of these cities and go for it. There will have been a few years of buildup. And so you kind of have to look back as to what, what's been going on with other countries. For example, could some country decide, I'm going to go to some conferences two or three years ago that are attended by city managers, by water utility experts, uh, traffic control engineers, maybe give out some freebies, have a little booth, get to know them, collect some business cards. You're going to do all that intelligence ahead of time. And that's going to bear out a little bit of, of what you discussed is who's weak, you know, who doesn't get it, who can I fish, who can I target. That may help me decide if I'm going to have to do something like this. It's not necessarily which city makes the most sense. Is it the port of Los Angeles, the port of Houston, New York? It's which city is the easiest. Because I want to, I want to just slide under the radar and, and I want to send a message at the same time. So it's hard to say who it would be. It would be based on a few years worth of research. And that's if a nation state's doing it. 
if it's just some protagonist, you know, an activist or whatever, they may just target several cities. Just see who, see who answers my email or see who takes a USB key or who, see whose website I can deface. And they'll go after, as they call, the low-hanging fruit. The problem with most metropolitans, though, is they focus on city services. They want to keep the lights on, they want to keep the power running, traffic safe, dash cam videos. Uh, a lot of times they can't attract the good people to keep their systems secure. And so they're suffering the brain drain. Most of those who really get this go to the private sector. And maybe cities will contract with an IBM or Dell Secure or McAfee or somebody, but to have the best of the best on their staff generally doesn't happen. And so then you wind up with places like Atlanta that are surrounded by lots of smart people, but you don't have those people working for the city. And working so for the city puts, to protect yeah, it. Yeah, that puts them at great risk here. Now, you mentioned you know, what I would attack if I or a nation state. Mm -hmm. um, the Director of National Intelligence uh, briefed reporters this year on its survey of top nation state cyber attackers. And uh, of course, China and Russia were at the top of the list, North Korea and Iran on the list, but lesser players. And they described, just to paint a broad brush stroke of their briefing, that China seemed to hack with the purpose of stealing intellectual property. Mm -hmm. Russia does a lot of work to get inside um, electricity grids, things like that, probing attacks, possibly to leave something behind for later or to see what's vulnerable. Why do you think that is? And, and have you both come across that in the private sector? Um, I think there's, there's a general trend that if you're doing cyber espionage, you're there for the long term. You want to understand the business processes of a company, let's say, or manufacturing processes uh, to imitate them later, right, to replicate them. So you're there for the long run, uh, which is why you're stealthy. You don't want to leave anything behind, right? You don't want to be discovered. Uh, versus if, you, if you're there just to harm, then, you know, you don't care. So. You know, you get in, you do your damage, and, and you leave. You're not as much worried about, you know, leaving traces behind. Well, the other thing that I've heard frequently from intelligence officials is that Russia is smart enough not to leave tracks behind, but has been, as if on purpose, mm -hmm. as if to say, we were here. Well, part of that, too, is like in a nuclear world. Just because you have a nuke is one thing, but if you can test it and demonstrate so people can see and observe that it works. In cyber, that's a little, little hard. It's one thing for a nation to say, we have great cyber strength, but you still have to demonstrate it somewhere. And that may be what you're seeing is... So this is an act of deterrence. Deterrence as well as also just showing. I have what I say mm -hmm. I have. I'm not just making this up. But your earlier point about China being more espionage focused, absolutely. Their long game is the thousand year game. Uh, Russia's long game might be a hundred year kind of thing. And if you look at the way China's working, we're talking deep infiltration of, of markets, devices. It's, it's not just let's get in where I can manipulate something, but let's control everything and make it look like we, the United States, think that we're in control, but they're the ones who are trying to maintain it. So theirs is very long, very stealthy. And you saw last week uh, the article about the little embedded devices. Um, hmm. Not okay. new for those of us who are in cyber. We've been dealing with these things for years, but it's, it's somewhat new to most people to, to actually realize that these little teeny tiny rice grain sized devices could be put onto a circuit card and then distributed and providing you with some sort of remote access. And of course, that was a Bloomberg story and there's a bit mm -hmm. of controversy around it because Bloomberg alleges that these devices were on these chips, yeah. but um, all the manufacturers involved have, have pushed well, back and said it's of not denial. true. Yeah. But we have to be clear too, they're not the, China is not the first one to do this. They're, they're have, this has happened before, right? Well, the other thing that uh, this gets to is attribution. Mm -hmm. I mean, how can you strike back if you can't attribute? And from everything I've heard, it's only getting easier and easier to hide your tracks. So uh, how do you feel in, in the R&D world? Uh, are people getting a handle on attribution? Just to uh, ask a really broad question that we could have a whole conference on? Um, I think attribution is still a challenge, right? So uh, malware analysts rely on reverse engineering malware to understand uh, 
you know, they use things like when was this malware compi compiled, uh, or they see some traces in, in terms of you know uh, documentation or things like that uh, to infer who created that malware. Um, but all of that can be information that's being that's you know put on purpose in Le order left to mislead. Left there to cast exactly. dispersions on exactly. someone else. Uh, you know, a lot of these malware get reused, right? So the fact that somebody created the malware in the first place, now you have another entity or party reusing it, you know, and you're tracing back to the, oh, the original one, um, that basically misleads attribution. So I think uh, we really have a very big challenge in terms of attributing all of these attacks to the right um, parties conducting them. But we do have something in our favor. The bad actors use the same tools as the good actors. And, and where I'm going with this is if I'm a bad person creating evilware, I'm building it in the same operating systems as the good guys have. So it's the same vulnerabilities, same weaknesses. And in the last 10 years, GPS has really taken over. Almost everything now is tagged with some geolocation on it. It's very hard to, to stay anonymous in terms of your location. And what this means is that as we get more and more geolocated things, attribution is actually becoming a little easier. It's still stealthy, but it's not impossible. Uh, bad guys also make mistakes, make the same mistakes the good guys make. And this has been well known for decades, that you can exploit mistakes made by the adversary. So they are no more perfect than we are. We use their mistakes against them. And we can implant things going the other way. You can leave something out, have them bring back a document that sends messages home. There's all kind of fun little ways. The internet also follows the rules of physics. I mean, it is a physical thing. It's fiber optics and radio signals and so forth. So there are ways to figure out where on the planet somebody can't be versus where they are. And you can rule things out just by using physics. So there's some kind of neat little things we can play with where we can rule out parts and kind of make good guesses about where they might be. It's not saying it's perfect, but we've come a long way in the last 20 years in terms of understanding how things work in cyberspace and how we can actually get closer to where, who's behind it, what's their motivations, what are they up to? So speaking of coming a long way, um, since you helped stand up DHS, uh, how are we doing in terms of finding this bad actor finding this bad code, this malicious code, and alerting people to it. I mean, I see that this month is uh, the, the Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Yeah. Cybersecurity Awareness Month, you know, I know because NSA, uh, at NSA Gov tweeted it out. Mm -hmm. um, but we've had earlier panels where people are still griping. They're not getting the information out to us so that we can act on it fast enough. Yeah. How do you think? How do you think their old shop is doing? Oh. <laughs> um, so uh, honestly, uh, I mean, I, I think DHS is doing a great job at um, providing the tools uh, for folks to use, uh, encourage them to use them. They have all these threat intelligence feeds that they're making available uh, for companies to use. I mean, how, how does that information arrive to you? Um, is it in the form of alerts and emails? Is it? A it's you have to subscribe to it. You mm -hmm. have to, yeah. You have to take action in order to receive that. Mm -hmm. uh, what we're not seeing as much of is, you know, the private sector uh, and private companies engaging in with sharing their own information. So if they go through an attack, sharing that with uh, their peers, with people in the industry, that's what we're not seeing as much of. Uh, yeah. Because that's where the learning comes from, right? But, but of course, corporations don't want to reveal that they have been exactly. successfully so, attacked. So there is some good there, the ISACs, I'm sure you're familiar with that, right. Information Sharing Analysis Centers. What Washington's filled with acronyms, so ISAC. Um, started pre-September 11th, so this, this got going in the late 90s, Clinton administration. The idea being is critical infrastructure owner operators would rapidly share information amongst themselves, and then some derivative of that could go to the government for law enforcement purposes or whatever. What's happened today is financial services, for example, does a real good job between the banks of sharing, and they talk a little bit to Department of Treasury and to DHS, but because of the privacy laws, there's a lot of reluctance to what they're sharing amongst themselves in the private sector to go to the government because they're afraid of privacy violations. Um, the government, of course, once it goes to the government, it, it spreads out. 
there's, it's kind of hard to share with DHS and say, I don't want the FBI to look at this, or I don't want NSA to look at it, or others, because once shared with the government, you're shared widely. So the private sector still has these barriers. Uh, some are process, some are legal, some are just a mindset of not wanting to tell the government. But to the government's credit, they do, as you say, they put out lots of alerts and warnings, it's just the general public doesn't know they're there. Uh, I get daily feeds from DHS, lots of great information, but you'll never see it on CNN, you'll never see it on Fox, you'll never see it out where the public's looking, unless it's something newsworthy like Atlanta just shut down, or there's a chip embedded you know, in, in hardware coming out of China. So say the worst does happen and another city gets attacked like this, mm -hmm. whose responsibility is it to pick up the pieces? The cities. Pardon? The city. The cities. Yeah. So the federal government doesn't have like federal a, government can provide a resources, cleanup team to... Resources to help, much like FEMA does in a, in a physical disaster. But take what happened with the hurricane in Florida. State of Florida and those counties are responding. FEMA's helping, they're providing resources. Cyber would work the same way. Homeland, whom of DHS, or, or, or perhaps the National Guard military can provide resources, but they would not take it over. I, I would not see the federal government coming in and running the city of Atlanta, for example. Uh, as I invite folks to step up to the microphone for questions, um, I wanted to ask the uh, opposite side, why don't these attacks actually happen more often if these cities are so vulnerable? I, I think they have happened. Uh, so before Atlanta, the uh, Colorado's Department of Transportation was attacked exactly the same way with the same ransomware. Uh, there was an entire campaign that happened before the Atlanta attack uh, where, you know, this group that was responsible for creating this SAM malware called SamSam, -Sam, you know, harvested hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, it's perhaps that we're not hearing about them just, as Just much like companies news. don't yeah. want to spread mm -hmm. or that they yeah. got attacked? Exactly, yeah. 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 Part of it is we're, we're looking for the big bang attack. Mm -hmm. You know, we want something to blow up. Mm -hmm. As opposed to death by a thousand this cuts. This stuff, yeah, this is criminal in nature. It, it, it doesn't blow things up. They're there to get money. It's extortion. And that's, that's like robbing a bank, you know. That, so the majority of them are criminal in nature, but you, we, we do know that nation over, states are probing. Well, probing in equals equals attack, some people would say that's the same. Others would say it's just probing and an attack is when bad happens. And of, you know, of course, that, North Korea is actually right engaging in criminal attacks to bring in money Absolutely. to the state coffers. Absolutely. No. Uh, sir, in the middle. Hi, I'm Mark Sunday. Is the mic on? Now it oh, is. Okay. Hi, Mark Sunday. I'm the Chief Information Officer of Oracle uh, and uh, the security team that is responsible for our global infrastructure in over 100 countries reports to me. What should I be asking them that I likely haven't asked them? The unknowns is the right question. Um, for those of you who are not in security, one of the things we worry about is what we don't know. So the question would be then, what have you not asked them? Ranging from assets to people to install base, I mean, there's a whole gamut of things. What have you not asked them? What knowledge do you not have? So you're but, deferring the question to them. <laughs> but, exactly, I, I yeah. have to because I'm, I'm yes. not in your seat. I, yeah, I don't no, know I, what no, you don't that. know. I appreciate that, I was just kidding. Um, yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, I uh, understand uh, the threat landscape for Oracle specifically. Uh, do you think there will be adversaries tar targeting Oracle specifically for whatever motive they might have, right? Yeah. So as opposed to the regular attacks against every technical company right. or, you know, attacking but, for ransomware. Uh, what should you be worried as Oracle? Uh, in terms of your reputation in China or <laughs> Russia, I don't know, are there any things you have to be concerned? Right. Well, with? in a company like Oracle, like, like any other major worldwide company, you've got lots of decentralized assets, lots of people who are doing good things around the world, but is that information flowing back up to your level or, or up to Mary Ann or someplace where you can see the bigger global picture? Is good happening in some country and is bad happening elsewhere and the two teams don't know of each other? Those are the unknowns I'm talking about. And, and so oftentimes large multinational co companies have all the awareness they need. It's just that that awareness isn't shared inside the company. It doesn't always get up to the top. The government's the same way mm -hmm. in, in terms of pockets of knowledge, but it's not getting up to where somebody can action on it. 
So what kind of advice would you give to city managers? Uh, should they all be investing in backing up all of their systems all the time? Should they be bringing in private contractors? What, what are some cheap solutions? I think certainly, you know, having a disaster recovery recovery um, business continuity plan, backing mm -hmm. up all of your uh, data in advance, uh, being prepared, having the right talent, right hiring, the right talent, and, and keeping that talent, um, preparing your communications plan uh, when there is a crisis, having your incident response plan, you know, all of those are important, but also having a uh, stream of funding, right, uh, when th something happens that, that you can rely on to, to be able to respond, and building the relationships with your third-party contractors, vendors, so that when you need them, when the systems are down, you can reach out to them immediately to, to bring things back you know, up. Cyber is a, is a peril like fire, flood, other things. It's something that people don't really understand, so they want to put it on a pedestal. But if you lost a data center due to a flood, what's the difference between that and losing a data center due to ransomware? You've lost the data center. You know, so what is your plan to restore and recover that data center? Do you have another one someplace else? Are there backups, for example? Um, at some point down the road, I think cyber will kind of become less of a limelight thing as we more understand how this interacts with us. But many businesses don't even know what it is that's the most important thing to them. If I lose this, I go out of business. I cease to exist. And if they can at least identify that, it's exactly what you're saying in terms of business continuity. I have to protect that, both cyber, physical, human, all the things that go around it. But others, they want to just start in a different place and say, I want to buy firewalls and IDSs, do all this password stuff, but they don't know what they're protecting. So people do flood drills, people do WMD drills, right. how often do they do a cyber attack drill? But even when they do those drills, mm -hmm. do they know why they're doing it? What is it you're trying to prevent? Is it loss of human life? That's fair. Is it something that's in this safe on the third floor down the hall? I mean, what exactly are you trying to protect by doing these drills? And many businesses don't even ask that question. Sir. Hi. Yeah, I'm following up on a question that you asked, Kim, which is why this hasn't happened more often. If, if I wanted to rob a bank, the best way I can rob the bank is to create a distraction down the street. I blow up a car, all the first responders go to deal with that. Meanwhile, I'm inside the bank robbing the bank. So I could probably, with one phone call, shut down the Los Angeles International Airport. Mm -hmm. If I called and said there's a bomb, yep. mm -hmm. I could shut it down mm -hmm. and chaos would ensue. And if I did that with the power grids and all of the other structures like that, all at the same time, this country would be in mass chaos. So I'm just curious what your thoughts are as to why somebody hasn't been doing this mm -hmm. at the same time with that distraction, they could be coming in in the cyber world and creating even more chaos. So you step back to a non-technical analysis. Why would somebody do it? What's the motivation? What's the gain? What's the rationale? Okay, so when the terrorists attacked on September 11th, the 19 hijackers, there was a clear motivation. They knew they were gonna die, but there was motivation for what they're doing. If I wanted to target, say, a dozen cities across the United States to do disruptive things, it would have to come, there's gotta be some motivation behind it, whether that's for a political gain, financial gain, whatever it is. I think right now we don't, there's no group out there. There's, Russia's not gonna do that. They're not gonna disrupt a dozen cities and, and claim credit for it. China's certainly not going to do that. A terrorist group could, but we've done a pretty good job since t September 11th of identifying terrorism. So a guy yesterday was identified with some 200 pound bomb that he wanted to blow up on the, on the National Mall on election day. So we're getting doggone good at finding these types of people. So barring war or barring some other sort of big breakout, you're not gonna see the situation where multiple cities are targeted stealthfully. Now, if we're on the brink of war, totally different. So I think it's not so much technical, it's the motivation of the actors. It's not saying it would never happen, mm. but we have to put it in that context of where we are in the world, who we have relationships with, who would be most likely to do something like this. And maybe that could be the first sign that we are on the brink of war, yeah. something could, like that. Could be, right. But the other, the technical side, it's technically hard to pull this off in multiple locations at the same time. And because it's technically hard to do, you don't see a lot of effort to try and do it 
because it is technically hard. You can't stop the power grid, for example. Be, be, regardless of what Ted Koppel says in his book, there is no switch out there where I can turn the grid on, turn the grid off. It doesn't work that way. It's a big kinetic inertial thing. It would take hours to wind these generators down. Um, that doesn't sell books when you talk like that, but that's why the, the grid is very resilient. Air traffic control, very resilient. Banking, very resilient. Doesn't mean there's little problems here and there, but the entire system is very resilient. So that may be also part of the underlying reason why you don't see these things is hidden resiliencies inside those infrastructures. So uh, it would be better, I've heard, if people were allowed to have systems that were separate from the grid that they could cut off from the grid. And right now in many states, that's, that's banned from doing that. But that would build more resilience. That that's true. It's not banned, but, but I'll work with you on the theory. I, 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 <laughs> I, I've had some solar yeah. power advocates complain yeah. that they couldn't do it in some places. What I'd like to add to that answer is that if we're talking specifically about the attack against uh, the city of Atlanta, mm -hmm. this was a ransomware attack, right? Correct. So if you pay the ransom, you know, you get your decryption key and you can reuse your systems. So we don't know if there are cities that were attacked and they paid the ransom, right? We don't mm -hmm. know even for Atlanta whether they paid the ransom or not. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's very, you know, probable <laughs> that th these attacks have been happening, but we haven't heard about them because they quietly pay the ransom and exactly. then they hire well, a contractor to make sure it never right happens again. They have good backups, and ransomware is no different than a fire or a flood. Ah. You just take it in stride, restore, and move along. And the other thing, if I'm, uh, if I'm the attacker and I, my motivation is financial gain, I'm not going to go necessarily after a city. I may go after a company, right, who mm -hmm. has deeper pockets. Right. And, and also has more of a reason to keep it quiet. Correct. Right. So, yep. yeah. um, so you both mentioned kind of quite a bit about having a good DR plan that integrates into BCP as a kind of backup if you may not have adequate security. I'm curious what both of your opinions are on cyber insurance then, because obviously you could invest your resources in any sort of technical solution or a DR plan, mm -hmm. or whether or not you would just simply get cyber insurance, which a lot of US companies are doing now mm -hmm. to basically mitigate. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I'll start. I think it's a great idea. And, and a market for cyber insurance is definitely there. Uh, many of the big insurance companies, though, what they face, though, is what's the right rate? What do I charge for this thing? And how do I know if the insured is actually healthy? So if you're going to get health insurance, you generally take a health exam and they kind of rate you as to where you are and how likely are you to become sick. I've seen some insurance companies do the same sort of thing. We'll do an assessment on you, a cyber assessment, and then we'll give you a rate based on your hygiene. You know, how do you, how do you feel there? I've seen others that are kind of a step ahead that say, okay, we'll, we'll cover you, but we're going to put devices inside your company that will keep track of how you're doing. And we will warn and alert, and we'll work with your third-party security provider to make sure you don't get broken into. So they're essentially they're protecting their investments. So there is a way for insurance companies to work with businesses together to where the business doesn't have to so much focus on it. They can just let the insurance company worry about it. But the insurance company is also providing a layer of security by working with the third-party security companies. So it's, it's kind of a neat market model. Yeah. Uh, and I think also, I, I think mm -hmm. very great idea. And uh, I know that DHS was looking at cyber insurance mm -hmm. as a way to encourage uh, companies to share, you know, their own uh, assessment of their own security posture, because then that allows, you know, the US in general, mm -hmm. not, not just DHS, to um, have a better uh, risk uh, assessment, right, right, for the entire country. Yeah, piece that, we don't have, area. though, because using insurance is a neat model, but if you look at fire insurance, there are fire codes. There's requirements for sprinklers and alarms and things that are by law. We don't have that in cyber yet. And I'm not sitting here advocating as other panels, so we don't necessarily need that legislation. But in order for it to work, we have to start thinking about, okay, should there be a code of some sort? Should there be mandatory cyber protective systems in order to, to create this economy where we can have insurance and have other things? I sense a growth opportunity for some future Big fire time. starters. Big time. With yep. that, thank you both very much. Thank, thank you. you.